Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And this is module 22 in my computer networks lecture series where we talk about the transmission control protocol or TCP. And so this is another point in the lecture series where we, it's useful to kind of take a step back and sort of take stock of where, we, where we've been and where we currently are right now. And so always when I do this, we sort of go back to our picture of the OSI protocol stack. And we've started, you know, from the bottom up, right, as we've worked through this lecture series. So we've talked briefly about the physical layer and how the physical layer takes the zeros and ones, converts them into analog waveforms that can travel, you know, back and forth on whatever physical analog channel is con connecting our nodes. Maybe it's a wire, maybe it's the wireless channel. We then spent a fair bit of time talking about the data link layer or layer two. And the data link layer is divided into two sub layers. The logical link control layer is where we introduce the notion of error detection as well as ARQ which is basically the retransmission of bad frames it, to give the appearance that you know our error prone link is actually error free. The next big topic we spent some time on was the medium access control layer. The MAC layer is where we implement the protocols necessary to manage many nodes competing for a shared channel. After that, we progressed to the routing layer. And the routing layer was, or is always a, a topic that I enjoy teaching because, you know, again, the routing layer is really kind of where we learn how the internet works. So we talked about um, IP addressing, IP routing, how routing algorithms like the Bellman Ford algorithm <clears throat> can use local information, just sharing information between immediate neighbors to construct um, routing tables that allow packets to be routed across an entire mesh network, in the case of the internet, across the entire world. And we talked also about hierarchical addressing and how that can be used to, you know, limit the size of routing tables so we don't have to store an individual routing table entry for every possible destination on the internet. Now we are at the point in the course where I jointly talk about the session layer and the transport layer together. The reason why I lump these two layers together is because TCP actually implements the functionality of both the transport layer and the session layer. And this is one of the examples, arguably one of the more famous examples of where, you know, the internet deviated from the, you know, sort of strict guidelines of the OSI protocol stack model. And so what I'm going to do in this module is I'm going to introduce TCP and as I do that, I'm going to essentially introduce both the transport layer and then the session layer, talk about, you know, the functionality that we assign to both of those two layers, again, at, at quite a high level. And then we're going to dive a little more specifically into TCP, talk about some TCP specific stuff, and then spend the next few lecture modules sort of expanding on uh, those topics in more detail. So to start off with the transport layer, one of the things that we are going to learn about the transport layer is that it implements ARQ retransmissions. And this seems a little bit strange, you know, initially, because we know from our discussion that um, ARQ is implemented at the link layer. So over wireless links, wired links, ARQ is running at the uh, logical link control layer or the data link layer in general. 
to correct any errors that may occur due to packet collisions, interference on wireless links and things like that. And so if the data link layer is doing its job, we shouldn't have any lost packets due to um, link level impairments like interference and noise. You know, we may experience a, a reduction in our effective throughput and we, we've talked about how to analyze that, but we shouldn't be experiencing um, lost or bad packets if the data link layer is doing its work. So how or why then is it necessary to do ARQ at the transport layer? Well, the purpose of the transport layer is to provide end-to-end -end reliability over a multi-hop network. And as it turns out, there is another mechanism for packet loss that operates above the, the link layer. And um, I've tried to show that in the, in the picture on this slide. And so individual links in most packet networks are very reliable. Either we've got a wireless link with ARQ running on it, or we've got you know a fiber optic link with very, very low error rates. Um, however, anybody who's used the internet knows that the internet isn't perfect. You know, we, we wait a long time for our transmissions, um, sometimes packets don't arrive at all. And th this is primarily due not to packet losses at the link layer, but to packet losses due to congestion. And so in a multi-hop mesh network, you know, where we sort of show each node or let's say each router or device as a, as a node or a dot in, um, in a mesh, you know, some routers can have a lot of links feeding into them. And any router that receives packets will attempt to buffer those packets. So if, if a router is receiving packets faster than it can transmit them, it's going to basically put um, those packets into, um, into a buffer and to just sort of save them while it tries to, you know, transmit them out to their destinations as fast as it can. So if this is packet number one, packet number one, maybe put in the first place on the buffer. If it arrives first, packet number two, maybe put in the second position in the buffer. If it arrives second, packet number three, in position number three and so on. However, it's quite possible and frequently happens that packets can arrive faster than the router can get rid of them. And so over time, the buffer in the router starts to fill up. And if this is a period of intense congestion, what can happen is, you know, if packet number four arrives at the router before we've had a chance to get rid of the first three, and if for the sake of this example, our buffer size is only three, then when packet number four arrives, it gets dropped. So it arrives successfully, there's no errors, but the router simply has no place to put the packet. And so it will not store that packet and the packet is essentially lost. And this is a very important mechanism, a very important loss mechanism on the internet and um, is usually the primary way that packets are, are lost on the internet. And so the purpose of the, of the transport layer is to ensure that end-to-end -end communication over a packet of uh, packet network or a multi-hop mesh network is reliable. And so when we think about the, um, the network from the perspective of the transport layer, we know that the internet is, is essentially a, a mesh network that consists of multi-hops. The purpose of the routing layer is to manage all those hops and take care of the addressing and the routing decisions and stuff like that. Because the, tr the transport layer is one layer above, it essentially treats this entire mesh network as essentially a black box. So the transport layer doesn't concern itself with 
you know, the fact that we've got multi hops and routers and addresses and stuff like that. It essentially treats the entire mesh network as a black box, sends packets into the black box, and expects that packets come out at the black box of the black box at the at the destination. So the transport layer takes the perspective of a source transmitting to a destination and doesn't worry about what's going on in between. And so in this particular example, we've got five packets that the transport layer is sending into this black box network. And what I've drawn over here on the right hand part of the slide is what we receive. So we, we send packet number five into the network first, packet number five arrives. We send packet number four into the network and packet number four maybe experiences some congestion or has to be retransmitted over a, over a, um, a bad link. And so maybe packet number four goes over this branch and starts to experience some delays, some um, it's sitting around in a, a router buffer, for example. And packet number three happens to be sent over a different link to the destination. And the link or the, the path followed by packet number three turns out to be faster than the packet or the path um, followed by packet number four. And so what can happen is that packet number three, even though it was transmitted after packet number four, it may arrive sooner. So we have out of the potential for out of order transmissions. So we've got, I'll just clean this diagram up here a little bit. So we have packet five arriving first, packet three arriving second with a little bit of a delay. Then packet number four finally works through its highly congested router to arrive after packet three. Packet number two doesn't arrive at all. It's perhaps lost due to buffer overflow. And then packet number one finally arrives. And so from a transport layer perspective, we've basically got two problems that we have to deal with. One is the potential for packet loss due to router buffer overflow. And the other one is um, contending with packets arriving out of order. And so to combat packet loss, the transport layer actually uses um, an end-to-end -end ARQ mechanism. And to combat out of order packets, the transport layer uses sequence numbers. And so those are the, the two main things that um, the transport layer, or the two main tools in the transport layer toolbox. And we'll work through some examples later on to see exactly how ARQ and sequence numbers are implemented. The next bit of functionality implemented in TCP is the functionality that related to the session layer. And the session layer is basically where we implement the handshaking and the control messages necessary to establish and terminate a connection on the internet. And um, the term session refers to the exchange of control information, handshaking information over using predefined rules in order to establish a, a means for, for exchanging data between nodes. And um, before user data can be exchanged, session layer entities on both machines will send control messages in order to establish a session. And I'm going to look, or we're, we're gonna look into like very specifically an actual TCP session and the actual messages sent by TCP to establish a session in a lot of detail. Uh, we're gonna work through a, an example with diagrams and with Wireshark, but for the purposes of just introducing this concept, here's a very simple um, session that's based on a conversation because I said right at, right at the very beginning of the lecture series that, you know, we we follow protocols all the time and um, particularly kind of session layer style protocols are what we use when we have a conversation with people. And so let's consider an example here where we've got two nodes that want to communicate. The first thing, um, let's say node A is initiating the 
um, communication link or the session with node B, the first thing that node A is going to do is send a, a hello message that essentially just gets the attention of node B. If we have successfully um, captured the attention of node B, node B has to indicate this. So node B will send a message back saying hello back, indicating that it that node A has its attention. Once we've established that node B, um, that we have node B's attention, we need, often will do a little bit of um, establishing the, the system status. We wanna make sure that node B is not only um, aware of us, but has the capacity to communicate. So we might send a message um, just saying, Hey, node B, how are you? Like, are, are you, are you doing okay? Do you have, um, time to talk with us right now? Node B will indicate that, yep, I'm doing fine. How are you? Node B might want to know how you're doing before the, the session, um, commences. And then node A will also return an I'm fine system status style, style message. So at this point, node A has captured the attention of node B and both parties have established that um, the other has the capacity to communicate. And so we would say that this is basically all control messaging up to this point. So no actual user information has been exchanged. And this is the way TCP works as well. So before the very first bit of user data can be sent between nodes, there are um, a number of control messages that are exchanged kind of um, behind the scenes. Once the session is established, then we can go ahead and exchange information. And so this is the point where, you know, if this is an online game, we're um, exchanging uh, gaming information, if this is some sort of chat program or social media program, this is where we're doing our posting and we're reading our, our data. And, but at, at some point, you know, whatever our application is concludes and um, it's necessary to terminate the connection. And so typically there will be a um, termination style message. In this case, node A just says, I have to go goodbye, node B acknowledges that the session is um, terminating by sending a goodbye control message back. And so this last little exchange again is session control style communication where um, we're sending messages not to exchange actual user data, but to, um, in this case, terminate the session. So now getting into some of the, the specifics of, of TCP, uh, we, we've all, I've already mentioned that TCP combines both transport layer and session layer functionality. TCP attempts to achieve sort of three kind of design goals or design abstractions. The first one is that TCP wants to appear connection oriented. So we've talked about how the internet is just so radically different from the telephone network. The telephone network used to switch in a dedicated, literally a dedicated electrical circuit between two nodes that were communicating. And now, of course, we understand how different the internet is. We've got shared um, infrastructure. We've got multi-hop mesh networks. We, you know, packets from multiple users go through the same router. They can travel different paths. Um, but at the TCP layer, the TCP layer wants to make the internet in many ways look like a telephone system. So the TCP layer wants to make it look like your computer has a direct connection to whatever computer it's um, exchanging data with over the internet. It wants to make the internet look like it has given you a dedicated, private, reliable communication link from your node to the node that you're interested in talking to. And so I've always found that kind of interesting. So as, as radically different as the internet was, the designers still at the end of the day wanted to give you the same thing that the telephone network always gave you. And that made sense when the internet was developed, but now as applications have evolved where 
you know, we have many, we have, you know, applications where, you know, one node wants to potentially share information with many nodes. Um, this one node to uh, one other node communication style is um, perhaps something that is going to have to be re-examined um, in the future. Of course, you know, from taking Twitter as an example, Twitter seems like, um, you know, we have one device broadcasting to many other devices. In fact, that broadcasting is made up of um, really a series of one-to-one -one communication links. So if, you know, I have something that I want to tweet, I don't send this message directly to all the people that uh, might be following me on Twitter. Really what happens is I establish a one-to-one -one connection with a Twitter server and then all of my, my fans, here's fan number one, fan number two, let's say I only have two fans on Twitter, which it would be maybe <laughs> kind of realistic. So each one of my fans, rather than connecting to me, also have one-to-one -one, um, connections with the, with the server. So even though when it seems like we're broadcasting on the internet, we're actually implementing that with a series of one-to-one -one connections. TCP wants to make our connection look reliable. So it wants to look like the old telephone system, using sequence numbers to put pack out of order packets back in the right order, using ARQ to retransmit packets that are lost. TCP is trying to make the internet look like a dedicated communication link that's completely reliable. And finally, the third abstraction or the third goal is um, TCP wants to make our connection look like just a byte stream. And you'll, we'll understand this a little bit better when we, when we look at the application layer, but Basically, the designers of the internet wanted the internet to look from a programming perspective, kind of like we are reading and writing from a file. So we have um, just a series of bytes that we want to send over the internet. Maybe it's an array of data. We're programming in C and we've got an array of messages. Um, TCP essentially allows the our connection to look like a uh, um, basically like writing to a file. So we can take a stream of bytes, an arbitrary number of bytes, just write um, write those bytes or send those bytes to our, our connection. And then TCP takes care of chopping them up and, and putting them into packets. So when we're, when we're using a, an internet, when we're using a, uh, well, sorry, when we're programming an application to send data over the internet, we don't have to worry about packets or anything like that. We can just basically stream bytes to the connection and TCP takes care of the rest. Another important bit of functionality provided by TCP is something known as port numbers. And port numbers essentially allow one computer to maintain multiple simultaneous connections over the internet. And of course, we do this all the time. So um, on our computer, we might have a web browser open, we might have a social media application open, um, maybe we're listening to some streamed music. All of these different app networked applications will have different dedicated connections over the internet to different servers where, um, where they're using the servers to, to send and receive data. And this is implemented at the TCP layer using something called port numbers. And so an internet, a connection on the internet is identified uniquely by two pieces of information. The first one is the IP address. The IP address, as we now know, identifies our physical device, our laptop, our phone, whatever it is we're using will have an IP address. However, the second piece of information that we have to specify also is the port number. And so the fact that we have port numbers, and I'll, I'll go through some examples and it'll, be, it'll become more clear how this works, but port numbers identify basically the connection or the service that is running on that particular device. So IP address 
identifies the device, port number identifies the service or the connection. Um, port numbers are si 16 bits, so they go from zero to 65,000. And some port numbers are standardized based on service. So for example, um, HTTP uses port 80. So when you're, for example, connecting to a web server to get HTTP um, information, you will always specify first the IP address of the server and then second, a port number of 80. And the web server essentially kind of listens on port 80 for, for incoming connections. If we have an encrypted SSH connection, we use port 22 and so on. Um, basically all port numbers under 1024 are reserved and are administered by the IANA. The remaining port numbers above 1024 are assigned on a dynamic basis by the TCP protocol stack running on each machine as, uh, as we're gonna see in a moment. And the way port numbers work is um, basically a pair of IP addresses and a pair of port numbers will uniquely identify a, can, a single connection between one process or application and another process or application, usually running on different machines, but sometimes even running on, on the same machine. So as an example, let's take the University of Calgary web server. So the University of Calgary web server has IP address 136.159.37.42. All programs that want to download web page data, website data, from the web server have to connect on port 80. And so we have many computers that are connecting to this particular address and port 80 as, as a port number. However, those connections can still be uniquely identified because the computers connecting should all have different IP addresses and different port numbers. So for example, if we're connecting on our home computer, the IP address of our home computer might be 104.157.123.123. And the port number that we're using might be arbitrarily chosen by the, the TCP protocol stack as um, 7,689. If a second computer connects to the web server, The web server connection will still have the same um, web server IP address and port 80, but the IP address on the home computer end should be different. Um, sometimes also we can have two web connections on the same computer. So there's no reason why um, on our current computer, we couldn't open up a second web browser and connect to, again, the University of Calgary website and browse maybe a, a different portion of the website if we were perhaps looking, um, maybe we were doing some registration or something like that. In that case, the IP address from our second um, TCP connection would be exactly the same because we're connecting from the same computer, but the port number would be different. And it would be, you know, assigned a, a different port number by the TCP protocol stack. Port numbers are also a key part of having multiple um, internet connected devices coexist within your home. And this is achieved using something called network address translation or NAT, which is implemented on your you know, router firewall that will be given to you by your internet service provider. And so just to dive into this example, when you get internet access from your, um, from TELUS or Shaw, you'll get a, some kind of modem and that modem typically has one IP address. So TELUS will give your whole house one IP address. And then it's up to your gateway at home to share that IP address amongst all the different network devices you have within your house. And so in this particular example, 
the IP address given to us by TELUS, let's say, is 104.157.123.123. And that is the only IP address that is visible on the internet for our house. Let's say we are um, in a situation where both you and your roommate are connecting to the exact same um, University of Calgary web server. So you're connecting to the web server and your roommate is connecting to the web server. You only have one IP address given to you by TELUS. How is it possible both of you can connect at the same time? Well, let's step through how ne network address translation works. And so within your own connection, um, let's say, you know, you, everybody in your house has a, has a Wi-Fi connection, for example, to the, um, to the gateway. The gateway is going to give you your own local IP address within your home local area network. And typically these IP addresses served up by, by home gateways are part of the 192.168 family. And if you'll recall, any IP address that starts with 192.168 is not for general use on the global internet. They are reserved for private networks. And so when you turn on your Wi-Fi card in your home, the gateway might give you IP address 192.168.0.1 and might give your roommate a different IP address 192.168.0.2. And just as a, as a bit of information, if you use a utility, for example, to, to look up your IP address um, on, your, on your laptop, if you're curious about that at home, it's very likely that you're going to see a 192.168 IP address because that's what the gateway has given to you. This is not how you will appear on the broader internet. If somebody is trying to connect to you or, or trace your packets, um, you know, over the, over the wider internet, they will instead see your, your gateways IP address. And, and we'll explain how that happens in a second. So, you um, are given IP address 192.168.0.1. And as soon as you start up your web browser, the TCP protocol stack will give your web browser connection a port number. And, you know, in this example, the port number is uh, 6839. You are then going to initiate a connection to IP address 136.159.37.42. And by default, your connection is going to ask for um, port 80 because you're making the connection using a web browser program. Your packets are then going to be sent, first of all, to the gateway. And the gateway is going to recognize that you're trying to send a packet over the broader internet. And the gateway says, okay, I know that the IP address I've given you doesn't work over the internet. So essentially what it's going to do is it's going to strip out your 192.168 IP address and replace it with the address that you've given from TELUS and also give it a different port number as well. So it's going to remember where your packets came from, but it's going to strip out your IP address and your port number and replace it with the TELUS IP address number or IP address and a different port number. It's going to then send the packet out to the web server. The web server will reply with a packet that is addressed to 104.157.123.123 and this port number. When that packet comes in, the gateway is going to remember that any packet with port number 7689 is supposed to go to your computer. And so it will then um, strip out the TELUS IP address and port number, replace the address and port number with 192.168.01, port number 6839, and will then send that packet back to your home computer. And that's essentially what network address translation does. It takes out the IP address and port number from the local network, 
replaces it with something that makes sense for the gateway. And then the gateway remembers to sort of put the local IP address and port number back when it's sending in um, the return packets. <clears throat> this mechanism also allows your roommate to share your same computer, um, your same gateway connection. The roommate has IP address 192.168.0.2. When the, your roommate starts up the web browser, um, it will choose a different port number. It doesn't have to for this to work, but chances are the port number will be different. It will send a packet destined for the U of C web server to the gateway. The gateway says, ah, okay, this is supposed to go out over the internet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to strip out the 192.168.0.2 IP address, replace it with the TELUS IP address and port number 12,398. It's not going to give this packet the same port number that they gave, you know, your home computer because the gateway needs to keep these two connections separate. So the gateway is going to use a different um, port number, send those packets out to the web server. The web server is going to reply back with a packet that is addressed to this IP address, this port number. The gateway knows that the 12, the port number 12,398 is supposed to go to your roommate's computer. And so it will strip out that IP address, replace it with 192.168.0.2 and send it back to um, your, your roommate's computer. So anyway, that's kind of a long winded example, I guess. Um, maybe I could have done that more efficiently, but you know, hopefully you, you see what's going on here at a high level. Um, because it's not just like, because we're not just using IP addresses, because we do have the flexibility to specify port numbers as well. The gateway has the ability to keep, um, to simultaneously manage multiple connections and um, using network address translation, simultaneously share one internet connection amongst many computers within the home. And um, this is key, right? So, I mean, obviously within um, your house, I'm sure that you have probably eight, maybe 12 different devices that uh, can connect to the internet. Maybe you have four or five of them simultaneously running all the time. And network address translation is what makes that possible.